All right, good morning, everyone. Um, Ted Unix, uh, I'm going to start in about 15 seconds. <laughs> So, my talk is a little different. Uh, can everyone hear me? I'm going to talk here. Yes. Yeah. Good? Okay. So, my talk is a little different than uh, any of the other ones. Um, basically, I'm talking about static analysis, but particularly static analysis of source code and how this affects uh, software development. So, this <coughs> is before we were engineering. <coughs> So why do you care uh, if you came to Recon? Why do you care about source code analysis? Uh, if you're on the development side, a lot of reverse engineering techniques can help you. However, the source code is a valuable object. This is what the developer is going to be changing. So this is the essentially the form of the program that the developer is most familiar with and is going to be working with. So it makes the most sense to analyze this part. Uh, a lot of the techniques uh, can be shared between source and binary analysis when you're trying to extract information about what a program does. Uh, the source and the binary are not totally equivalent. However, the source and the binary are essentially translations of each other, so they're roughly equivalent. And on the flip side, you can improve reverse engineering techniques by looking particularly for blind spots in the source analysis. Uh, as source analysis improves and achieves wider adoption, there are still things that it can't do, which reverse engineering is good at. And so, focusing reverse engineering by tools on areas where source analysis cannot go uh, leads to better coverage of the entire product. So, my outline, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this program analysis. Uh, where source code analysis lies within the realm of program analysis. Using source code analysis for security auditing and why this is different than other forms of defect detection using source code analysis, some of the challenges it uh, poses. And finally, deployment. Uh, if you are a consultant or a developer, uh, how do you get people to use source code analysis uh, and use it effectively? So, program analysis, you can break it down into you know, two axes, source and binary, and static and dynamic. Uh, it's really a spectrum, there's a lot of techniques which combine aspects of each approach. And on the whole, uh, most uh, techniques are complementary. You don't want to say one is better than the other, uh, they both have all other uses, and so this for a little flavor, though, I'm going to concentrate on source code analysis today. Um, source versus binary analysis. So they have a lot of differences. Uh, I'm going to run down here. So with the source, it's pretty easy to identify where the flaw is. It says file source.c line 72 buffer overrun. Uh, it makes it pretty easy for the developer to go back to the source and you know change the I less than or equal to 10 to I less than 10. Whereas with binary, if you find a buffer overrun, perhaps you know, fuzz testing or something, how do you map that back to the source? How do you fix it? You have to then go back to the source, carefully examine it, and or try to disassemble uh, the binary into a rough source correspondence. Um, one of the benefits of source code analysis is that it is CPU independent. So you're developing on a MIPS platform, and then you decide that the next generation of your product is going to be deployed on PowerPC. If you have built up an extensive uh, binary analysis platform for MIPS, it may not translate to a PowerPC platform. You have to rewrite your disassembler, and um, it makes it harder. So the source code is more portable in one way, however, it's less portable in another. So source code analysis is language dependent. Uh, this means if you're analyzing C or C++ and somebody adds a Java component to your final product, 
then the source code analysis is not going to help you. Where binary analysis may be language independent. Uh, it's not going to help you if you have a mix of C and Java, but if you have multiple compiled languages, uh, you can analyze them all at once. It also doesn't matter uh, if you're looking at something um, with source code and with binary, they may or may not be environment independent. Uh, what I mean here is with the source code, in order to determine what the source code is doing, you need a pretty complete um, representation of the entire program. You need to know what header files it uses, you need to have access to the header files, you need to know what libraries it links against, and so on. So determining how the source is going to finally perform in the uh, destination program is actually difficult if you only have some of the source. Whereas with binary, it you may have all the libraries linked in, however, you still don't know, uh, unless you're actually going to start running it, you know, what system calls it's going to make, how it's pushing data around. And so, uh, I would say that there, it's about a wash here. Um, biggest drawback, uh, if you are a like, post-mortem security analyzer, of course, is that the source code is available essentially first party only. If you don't have access to the source, you can't do source code analysis. Whereas with the binary, uh, you only need access to the program itself to start uh, analyzing it. So static versus dynamic. So static statements uh, mean that you are not attempting to actually run the program on your computer. Uh, running it in a virtual machine would be also would be dynamic. Where you need to have some way of executing the instructions. So static code um, analysis has very complete coverage. It's, gonna, uh, it's going to look at whether it's binary, every instruction, or source code, every single line. Dynamic analysis, it's very hard to get close to 100% uh, path coverage. And even if you have a code coverage tool uh, that's telling you that you are executing every line, it's going to tell you, you know, perhaps that you went through a loop one or two times. However, it does not mean you went through the loop with i equal to 100, which is when the buffer overrun occurs. So, uh, static analysis is better at identifying edge conditions and exercising the code in all possible states. Uh, downside of static analysis is that because it's attempting to exercise every state, it can also get into false states, which do not actually exist or cannot happen at runtime. So you get false positives. Dynamic analysis, due to its very nature, you can't have a false positive because if you're running the tool or you're running your code and it breaks, then it just broke, so you know that there's a flaw. Uh, with static analysis, you have the advantage that you can analyze essentially anytime, anywhere. Uh, this is a big advantage if you are working with an embedded system, um, trying to attach like a memory leak detector or something to a 16-bit microcontroller is pretty difficult. Where, uh, so if you're going to run, you know, Purify or something, or just even attaching a debugger to it, the level of control you have over a, you know, embedded target can be uh, minimal. Whereas with source code, if you're analyzing it statically on a larger host, you know, your desktop or a workstation, you can devote a lot more resources to it. You have a lot more memory available. And essentially, you can you know, put, to put together a cluster of machines to analyze source code, so you can go to you can analyze it to a very great depth, uh, very quickly if you have computing resources. Um, so essentially, it boils down to static analysis gives you a precise description of the problem. However, it can't tell you what the impact is. It doesn't know whether your resource leak is occurring in the main routine and it's only going to exit anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, but it just tells you there's a resource leak there. Where dynamic analysis, hopefully by running it, you understand exactly what the impact is. However, when you find out you have a memory leak, how do you know where it was or what caused it? So. The basic idea behind static source code analysis is that the source code has a lot of knowledge embedded. It contains 
not only information about what the program is going to do, but also a lot of information about what the programmer intended it to do. Uh, I'm not ca even counting comments here. Um, so if there is, for instance, a bounds check or something, it means that the developer thought that this variable might be above the bound. Uh, and so the key here is, though, is to extract the good parts and ignore the remainder. Because if you just present a, a developer with a you know, complete dump of the source and tell them everything that you learned about it through static analysis, it's going to be useless. And there's many types. Source code analysis uh, contains many subcategories. I'm going to be focusing on one, but uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview. Uh, so they have different ways to approach the problem, and source code analysis has a lot of different goals. Uh, primarily, uh, as I'm speaking about it, it's to find defects. You want to find buffer overrun. You want to find SQL injection. You want to find erase condition. However, you can also use it to enhance the runtime analysis. Uh, you, might be, you might want to instrument your code to insert bounds checks uh, on all pointer accesses. However, you can use source code analysis to prune those checks back after you, if you have proven that an access is safe. So it can be used for a lot of optimization. And it can also just gain insight into the code. If uh, somebody dumps a large third-party library on you, you want to know what it does. Does it work correctly? What are the interfaces to it? And how do they relate? So, quick overview of a couple techniques uh, one can use for uh, defect detection or analysis. Uh, type qualifier checking. So, for instance, if you have, this is like making a pointer const. However, there's a lot of extensions to this that various tools support, such as in the kernel, you mark all the user land pointers with a user flag and the kernel pointers with the kernel flag. And if, the, if you ever assign a user pointer to a kernel pointer uh, or a kernel pointer to a user pointer, that's bad. Because uh, that means you just gave user land control over what the kernel's going to do. Um, then there's simple pattern recognition. If you ever rep for stir copy in a piece of code, you've used pattern recognition, static to source code analysis. Um, so source rewriting uh, is a variant where you want to take source code in one form and apply some transformation to it so that in the end you get another uh, program which is equivalent but has some added property. Uh, this might mean all bounds checks um, for all pointer accesses. Um, model checking is kind of static, kind of uh, dynamic, depending on how you implement it. So you want to take a program, build up a model like a state machine, and then start driving it and see what falls out. Um, this um, can also, if you do it entirely statically, it's essentially simulated execution. Uh, there's many ways to go about simulated execution, um, which is you know, essentially running like a C interpreter. Uh, over your source code, um, which may or not be flow sensitive or context sensitive, which I'll describe in a minute. So for simulated execution, uh, which is, I think, the bulk of uh, a lot of commercial and uh, academic research in the field today, uh, flow sensitive means for instance, uh, the example source code attached there is we report an error if your analysis is not flow sensitive. For instance, you're freeing some global pointer in the, in the bar function and the bas function. Uh, a flow insensitive analysis is going to report a double free because it's going to say this function freed it and this function freed it. And so it's possible that this pointer is being freed twice. Uh, but flow sensitive just means that if you add a simple check, you know, to see that you can either execute bar or bas, but there's no code path which ever executes both, then there's no bug. Uh, context sensitive means that um, if there's some value such as use malloc and you allocate some memory, then there's use malloc and you free the memory, like this is more of a um, inner procedural uh, detection you want to eliminate the mem possible memory leak here. It's not possible to actually leak key, but if you're not tracking the full state of the machine you're in and you're just going statement by statement, 
uh, it's possible to, for a tool to make the wrong decision. Um, the big challenge here, though, is how much state do you track? Uh, any function which contains if, else, is going to have an exponential number of paths uh, for each if. So if you have 10 ifs, you are now to 1,000 ifs. Um, loops can be potentially you know, unbounded. A uh, tool might go through a loop over and over and over again. If you have an if or a switch inside the loop because you have you know, it's a parser or something, uh, it's very easy to get a tool you know, that it's going to attempt to run forever, attempting to execute every possible combination of state uh, that this uh, piece of code could go into. And essentially, the heap is unbounded. If you're analyzing C or C++ code, the heap is an enormous black box. Uh, there's pointers running around everywhere. You know, there, the values, uh, if you're attempting to you know, track it accurately, you need a lot more memory, um, and it's going to take forever. I mean, your program, you'd be better off with you know, like fuzz testing, because simulating the execution to that level of detail is very slow. <laughs> So advantages of uh, source code analysis is it should be automatic. Um, a lot of uh, reverse engineering techniques I think are pretty manual that the tool does a lot for you, but at the end it requires the user to go through and know what to look for. So uh, a good source code solution would, you could set it up in cron, it's going to run every night, it's going to automatically tell you what things change, new defects that were found. And its infrastructure should be capable of adapting to changing code bases. If you swap out a library, you should not need to reconfigure the tool. It should just automatically detect new source code, build it, and start analyzing it and integrate it with the rest of your project. And it's complete. Uh, it looks at all the code. It doesn't uh, you know, worry about whether this condition may or may not uh, occur in normal practice. And so it covers uh, a lot of things that you would might miss. Uh, challenges. So, why is this difficult? Uh, parsing is the biggest challenge to source code analysis. Uh, any non trivial analysis is going to require like a parse tree, uh, abstract syntax tree, and building this up from source code, if you're not using the same compiler as the compiler used to generate the code, is very difficult because nobody writes standard C. They write whatever compiler they're using C. And every compiler has dozens, hundreds of extensions. Um, some, most, if you're lucky, are documented. A lot are not. A lot of the extensions aren't even intentional. It's because uh, C++, for instance, is uh, almost impossible to write a decent grammar for. And so generating a parser for it, people make mistakes. And so the white code through, which should not be parsed, it's non-standard, it's a violation of the standard, but somebody thought it was convenient. Um, so in the long run, it's hard to analyze code if you can't read it. Um, those of you who are familiar with C or C++, uh, there's a couple of the most terrible examples uh, I've come across. Um, and so a lot of these come from just somebody thought it would be useful, or somebody didn't read the spec carefully, or somebody was in a hurry to get their uh, compiler out the door. And in particular, in uh, embedded space, one of the most popular compilers uh, for doing embedded development due to a vendor is GCC version 2.7. This was originally issued in about 1995, and people are still using it today. <coughs> So it's a couple of years behind, and it allows pretty much everything you see on this screen through. Uh, although some of these examples come from other compilers. So when you are working with a new code base, with a new compiler, or even with an existing compiler, but somebody discovered a new feature in it, um, how do you make your you know, parser run through? You can attempt to give up and you know, skip ahead to the next semicolon, next curly brace. Um, just ignore uh, unrecognized keywords and hope they don't matter. But of course, now you're getting farther and farther away from what the program is actually going to be doing it, and you're making your analysis less accurate. Uh, other challenges are what properties to look for. So if you're doing dynamic analysis, you don't really have to know necessarily what properties you're looking for. You just 
run the program and you wait for it to break. It's either going to crash, run out of memory, or you know, give you some error message that's unexpected. However, with static source code analysis, you're not sure you know, what the good conditions are and what the bad conditions are. There's you know, the old favorites, buffer overrun, memory leak, no pointer. Um, but for a lot of people, their code has more precise um, description that it has requirements that it must do X. Do not allow users to log in until they've given a password as well. How do you check for that in an arbitrary code base? Um, we can only analyze what we see. A lot of people link uh, the commercial world with third-party libraries. They buy you know, a MPEG decoder or something, which they only have the binary to. So anytime you pass a pointer into a third-party library, you lose, on, you lose a lot of information about it. You don't know what it's doing. If you get a pointer back, you don't know what data it contains. And so this makes it difficult. Even if you have the complete source, you have to understand how it's linked together. People will often implement a function with the same name in 20 different files, and they'll pick and mix match uh, different modules together to form different versions of the product. So how do they go together? Um, people using RPC, COM, function pointers, anything which uh, essentially defeats the call graph that you've built up um, makes it difficult to analyze. Uh, if data is going in and out of shared memory, you know, how do you track it? Uh, where does it come from? Anything read from a file? Um, there's a lot of things where you just don't know. And so the two biggest, uh, biggest downside to that then is false positives. Um, you're going to get a lot of false positives where you assume some pointer could be null, but there's a data dependency which says it's not. You're going to assume memory is leaked because it's passed to some function that you don't know anything about. It turns out that function adds it to a global linked list. <coughs> or on the flip side, false negatives. Um, if you um, no analysis uh, can be complete. Uh, I can't find you can't find all the bugs. Um, some other uses of source code analysis um, would be test generation. Um, so this is where you're not actually looking for defects, and this is a way to mitigate the effect of um, the limited power of analysis to find um, what I'm going to call false negative, which is a defect that you know is in the source code, but you can't find it using a tool. So you can use a source code analysis to find the edge cases faster. Uh, it works a lot faster than manually going through it. And so you can use this to create precisely directed test cases. Uh, if you know every, uh, if you know that you know R V is compared against the following seven options, you can generate test cases which exercise those seven options. But uh, it's better than generating random test cases, which are going to produce a lot of invalid input, which your program is going to reject out of hand. And. Uh, relevant to, uh, I think, many people today here today. Uh, source code analysis can provide you a window into the black box. So occasionally we have some of the source uh, to a program. If you're thinking about a web browser, it's probably using XML, JPEG, PNG libraries, which are open source. And so uh, a lot of commercial software, which you only have the binary for, is built upon uh, stuff which you may or may not be able to find the source for. If you have the source, you can, use, you can analyze it to discover properties about the API, which can assist you then in doing a uh, binary analysis. So which functions allocate memory? Which functions free memory? Which functions write to a buffer? How big is that buffer? Uh, can they take a length argument? And so using all this information, you can reduce the amount of source code or the amount of binary code you have to reverse engineer. Uh, so now I'll get to the security aspect. Uh, so the pros of using source code analysis um, for security. Uh, as I covered, it's thorough. It reveals the root cause and the path. And to some extent, you have data flow tracking. If you read some data in off the socket, stick it in a buffer, turn the buffer into an integer, use that to allocate some memory, um, and multiply it by the size of the structure, you know, you have an integer overflow. And so uh, trying to track data uh, through a binary can be rather difficult. Uh, the source, you have 
the distinct advantage that everything has a name and you can follow the name around pretty easily. Uh, cons and downside, you can't, you don't understand the impact. Uh, a bug, it may or may not be a security vulnerability uh, just because it looks like one. The program might not be privileged. The program might be running in a trusted environment. Uh, and some data dependencies are just too complicated to track. Where if X is 3 and Y is 4 and Z is 99, then this pointer can never be null. Um, you know, determining that statically uh, is pretty difficult. So there's also the consideration of what qualifies as a defect. You're going to flag every, cop every stir copy, or are you just going to flag everything that you are absolutely positive about? Uh, this is a trade-off between false positives and false negatives. Uh, a lot of stir copies can be safe if you, you know, perform a balance check before doing so, um, but also other people care. They don't want to miss anything, and so which side do you uh, err on? Uh, what properties can we determine statically? Um, pretty much anything that people are interested in, buffer overflows, integer overflows, race condition, memory leak, uh, this ranges from exploitable to um, just a denial of service. But uh, static analysis tool is unlikely to tell you whether something is exploitable or not. It's just going to tell you, hey, this is bad. So I'm going to step through a SQL injection example. Um, we have a pretty silly example here where we're going to read some data from a form, we'll presume this is a web form or something, um, you know, I wrote a CGI and C code, and then we're going to run a database query on it. So you want the analysis to tell you, you know, that name is going into this query and it's going to screw up your database if somebody throws a couple like ticks and delete froms in there as their username. So how does the analysis know that name is bad? And how does it know that run query is going to behave incorrectly given, uh, you know, user data? So the answer is essentially configuration. Uh, this can come, you know, can be included in the tool for a lot of common APIs, but uh, a lot of software development uses wrappers around common libraries, so it's going to be difficult uh, to cover this. So here I have a made-up config file. Uh, this syntax does not come from any. Uh, source code analysis tool known to me. Um, but what we're going to try to say here is that read form data, you know, it has the user data property on the return value, and run query, you know, is trusting of all its arguments. So with this configuration, we'll be able to find the defect. Now change it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to pull out, you know, all the form entries are now in a CSV, like one big string. Um, and so we're going to use stir uh, a couple of times to pluck out the name, which might be in the middle of the string. Uh, never mind for now that the fact that you might put a comment in your username. Uh, we'll assume that's dealt with some other way. Um, so now, how do we know that name is dangerous? Because now name is no longer coming from, name is now being essentially coming out of stir Is stir you know, is all data coming out of stir untrusted? Uh, so what you want to do is that, essentially like before, but now you have to add an additional configuration that Sturker essentially copies the property of its argument to its return value. So if argument zero was bad, now the return value is bad. Um, so how do we fix it? So the simplest uh, fix is you, have to in you insert some sort of escape SQL uh, function which hopefully is going to give you back a string which has all the back text escaped um, and whatnot. So we have to also now tell the analysis that this program uh, or this function is okay. It's going to give you back data which is safe to pass to a trusting function. Or you might have a different approach, which is that you have a validate name function, which is going to simply scan for illegal characters in the name. If any illegal characters are detected, it's going to return false. And so uh, now you have um, a more complex configuration where this thing has you know, a binary state attached to it. So what I just went through, you'd probably agree is pretty tedious to annotate all that by hand. 
Uh, so you want some way of doing it with the tool. Um, any large program, you're going to ask developers, you know, name all your sources of input, and they're going to give you a back blank stare. Um, you know, tell me everywhere you use potential user input as an array index. They have no idea. So annotating this is very difficult. Uh, it's an enormous time investment. Uh, so one technique is you can use statistics to derive function pairings. If you notice that every time somebody calls read form data, they call SQL escape or something immediately after, then there's a good chance that those two functions uh, always belong together. And so anytime that one of them is missing, then you have an error. Unfortunately, some developers can get it wrong more often than they get it right, in which case the stats are going to be uh, missing a lot of bugs. So an automatic approach uh, is you start to read, receive anything which you know reads data, and you assume that all the return values or the buffer um, that it's returning are tainted. And you just start propagating this uh, information everywhere that any time you you know, pass a string to A2I, the string came out of receive, or came out of struct, which came out of read, then that data is considered tainted as well. And then you can assume that all functions trust their input, um, so that any function argument is considered trusted. This is going to give you a large number of false positives at first. However, if you try to compute minimal paths between tangent input and uh, trusted use, it can actually converge pretty quickly in that you only have to annotate a few functions um, and then you quickly have to start getting pretty decent results. Uh, note, however, that through all this configuration, we have not verified that escape SQL works correctly. Um, we've told the analysis that this is going to give you back a safe string. However, we haven't told the analysis what a safe string is, and we haven't told it how to prove that. Uh, verifying that escape SQL works is actually something you probably want to do by hand, or with lots of test cases. Um, attempting to formally verify that uh, escape SQL is going to correctly escape all possible strings uh, is a lot of work, and a lot of the tools which you're going to use for broad coverage uh, are not up to the task, and a tool which is up to the task of verifying um, that a single function precisely follows the specification for it, assuming a specification is complete and doesn't have any bugs in it as well, uh, is going to run very slowly. Uh, program verification, even for a small program, can take weeks. So uh, this is a little uh, potential exploit in a, in a program. Uh, I don't know, you might want to raise your hand if you think you know that you could exploit this for uh, you know privilege ex escalation. So pointer equals malloc. Safe, unsafe. Uh, what if the argument came from HOI with string? What if the string came from a call to get in? What if we multiply by the size of a widget? Or what if the program set checks the uh, set UID um, and does ARX? Uh, is this a bug or not? So um, the answer is yes, because actually, um, if it uh, is set UID, then it's going to run this code. And if it's not set UID, then it's going to exit. So um, you know, having a tool like check, you know, if a function or a program contains a call to is set UGID, you might want to say suppress all errors in such a function or in such a program. However, that would actually give you the um, incorrect behavior here. Um, so knowing uh, what a defect is and knowing whether it's exploitable uh, can be very tricky for a analysis tool to determine. Um, I'm going to get back to soundness. Um, this is the idea that a sound tool will tell you uh, if there is a defect of a certain type, it is guaranteed to find it. It may find false positives, however, it will always tell you with 100% accuracy um, if a program is free of a particular defect. So if a sound tool says no buffer overruns, you can be confident that 
uh, for whatever constraints uh, were placed on the soundness of the analysis, there are no buffer overruns. Uh, one of the th first things to learn about um, C analysis, though, is that pointer analysis is hard. Um, well, as soon as you start throwing around like a void star or a car star, and it goes into the heap and it comes out, back out, you have no idea what points to what, and so. Um, in order to do a sound analysis, you almost essentially have to break down and say that everything points to everything else. At which point, proving that there's no buffer overruns is impossible. There's going to be buffer overruns everywhere. So, two choices that most uh, pragmatic tools make are you either leave some bugs behind or you get swamped under a pile of false positives. Um, and it's a delicate balance where you can you know, try tuning your analysis with various heuristics or algorithms to say uh, these things are more likely to be false positive, these things are more likely to be real bugs. Um, if it's a pointer increment in a loop, uh, then and you don't know what the bound is, you know, is it a bug, is it not a bug? If you know what the bound is and you can prove that it's safe, then it's probably not a bug. But uh, most analysis tools, even, even if they're not sound, are very good at catching the low-hanging fruit. Um, you'd be surprised, you know, it'll come up with 100 real bugs uh, very quickly. And it can also find dangerous constructs, you know, it can't tell you whether it's a bug or not, but you can say every time that you're incrementing two different pointers in a loop, um, you know, maybe there's something tricky going on, you want to look at it a little closer. So, uh, the biggest Cost, I think, associated with running an analysis tool um, are expecting false positives and missing false negatives. Uh, false positives are probably the most costly um, aspect of using a tool. Uh, I think a lot of people <coughs> underestimate their cost and you know just say, I want to see all the bugs. I don't care how much I have to wait through to get to them. However, if you have an uncontrolled number of false positives, you're going to have angry developers uh, who resent using the tool, and you can easily spend more time tracking down issues where a tool said, you know, this pointer points to this buffer and it's past the end, and you know, it got here by this code flow, and then you have to go back and verify if the code flow is correct or not. And you can easily spend far more time just chasing down a false positive than you would. Uh, you know, you can spend the time better doing uh, analysis um, by hand or generating test cases. And important consideration which people overlook is that over time, the trend is to 100% false positives. As you fix the real issues, the tool is not going to find them anymore. And so you're going to be left with nothing but false positives. So if you have 10,000 defects to start and you have a 10% false positive rate, and then you spend a year fixing them, in the end, you're going to have a thousand defects and it's going to be all false positives. How do you manage that? And how do you then determine when you change something and you have a thousand and one defects, how do you find the one defect which is new versus the thousand that were there and which you don't care about? Uh, so this is an important uh, consideration if you're going to adopt uh, a static analysis tool into your development framework. Um, false negatives, it's harder to estimate what the cost is here. Uh, obviously, if the bug you know, escapes into the field and you have to recall a billion dollars worth of routers, then that would cost the bug. But um, primarily, it's a false sense of security. Uh, I try to warn you, uh, no tool or very few tools are sound. If they are sound, they make assumptions like no dynamic memory. So if you're using dynamic memory, you know, your tool is probably not sound anymore. So if you are, instead of, a tool should you, you should use a tool to augment your development. You should not use it to replace testing or good development practices. It's not a parachute, it's just kind of like an extra seat belt. Um, only a limited number of properties um, can actually be verified um, and there's a lot of configuration and effort in actual formal verification of a software property. Uh, in the general case, it's impossible. Uh, for an arbitrary code base, you can't say, here's 20 properties, you know, prove they're right. So, uh, 
if you're on the source code analysis bandwagon, um, do you want to build it or do you want to buy it? Um, of course, I have a financial interest in that you buy it, but uh, one of the things here is that building it has the advantage that you can find bugs you're especially interested in. Uh, you know exactly what you're looking for, and you can build a tool which finds exactly that. However, it's very difficult. Um, I went over the parsing um, and a lot of the other considerations. Building a tool is a lot harder. Uh, and if, if you're going to make a useful tool, it's very, very hard. And unless you are the only user of it, uh, for instance, if you are a security developer, but you want to roll this out to all the developers in your company, you're going to find that your users are never happy. Uh, the tool's too hard to use, the output's too hard to interpret, uh, it doesn't run fast enough, it doesn't, you know, the configuration is difficult, it's always changing, uh, it goes on and on. Where uh, a commercial product has uh, probably solved a lot of these, it uh, doesn't have to be commercial, it can also be freeware, but uh, it checks a lot of properties which you may not have thought of, which are pretty common, and in general, um, the more flexible tools, the more value it's going to have over the long run. If you custom build a tool to analyze your networking stack, um, and you know that your inter network stack is event-driven with like a certain type of event loop, and you have to use a certain API, um, and so you build up a complex checker to verify that your event loop is being used properly and has no bugs in it, the next version of your product or the next team over um, that's you know, building something else cannot use your tool. Um, so you have some cost into it and you can't carry any of that forward. And a lot of people, um, this seems to be the trend that a uh, number of large software um, companies that I've dealt with is that they seem to think it's cheaper to have five, ten developers on staff building a software tool. Uh, you, consider how much those people cost per year. Uh, and I, I don't think it justifies the cost. Um, maybe if you are Microsoft, for instance, and you're building your own compiler, and so you have you know, all the parsing infrastructure and uh, optimization um, has a lot that's closely related with um, static analysis. You, know, you have all that infrastructure built in already, and it's a worthwhile investment. But if you're buying your compiler from somebody else, you know, you're, why, you didn't build your own compiler, why would you build an analysis tool? So understanding the tool, uh, this is, I think, uh, a large part of making successful use of the static analysis tool is understanding what it's trying to tell you. Uh, it does not you know, look at the code the same way that a developer does. In particular, error messages require a lot of interpretation. Um, you know, a lot of we've received a number of you know feedback from users where they say something like, "What do you mean this value n could equal you know, four billion, some number?" Uh, you know, I, I initialized it to negative one. Of course, they didn't realize it was unsigned. So, unsigned wraps around to a very large number. People, you know, the tool doesn't necessarily always, depending on the, how the output is generated, it may or may not tell you warning assigning. Uns a negative value to unsigned. It might instead just tell you that you're indexing into your buffer at you know index four billion. Um, so in general, the so the problem is caused by the fact that the tool has too much information to present at all. So it has to select some subset which to the tool you know makes a guess as to what is interesting to the developer. Um, if it told you. You know, if the tool dumped out the complete state uh, of every you know potential value that it tracked, you know that x could be three, four, five, six, ninety nine, one hundred and two, but not two seventy seven or two eighty eight, and it went through this loop sixteen times, you know, and it dumped out all that information, then you would have a very hard time, you know, just identifying the important parts of the defect. And so, the best solution I can really tell you is. Uh, just get regular exposure to your tool. Um, it's talking to you in you know, its own little language, but the more familiarity you have with it, uh, the better accustomed you'll be, and it actually becomes very easy to interpret very opaque messages. So, um, usage of the tool, you know, how to use it if you're a developer or um, 
So the tool is static, however, usage of it should not be. Um, you're not going to derive much benefit from an analysis tool if you simply, you know, drop it and use a local bin and start running it. Um, you know, you set up your prime job and you run it and then you stop using it or you set it up and run it every night, but you're not looking at the results on a regular basis. And so it's most effective to use it um, throughout the development process. Uh, too many people, you know, think it's a waste of time that they're going to introduce little short-lived bugs and they're going to fix them. They don't want to waste time with the tool reporting something that's going to be fixed, you know, in a short time anyway. But that's actually what you want to do because if you have a short-lived bug and then, you know, it goes down to QA and then the QA team finds it and then sends back, oh, hey, you know, uh, last build regression, uh, you know, you're going to have to go back, find out why. Where it's cool if you run it like before you check in, it's going to tell you, you know, it's going to save all the developers time, it's going to save you a lot of time. And really, the week before the release is not the time when you want to be going through your entire code base and churning all your pointers around because um, you're going to introduce more bugs um, if you're in a hurry. Um, one of the things is most tools, uh, unless you've built it yourself, uh, are going to come with a stock set of checks that they perform, but a lot of them can be adapted to your unique problems. Uh, you want to look at configuration and spend the extra time to set the tool up right, look at the problems you're fixing, figure out why the tool didn't find them, or how it could help you find them, and then turn, like, keep uh, evolving the tool so that it becomes uh, better adapted to your coding dimensions. Um, one thing that I think a lot of people are tempted to do is to eliminate false positives. Uh, some people have a dogmatic view that uh, the code isn't clean until you have zero error reports coming out. Uh, that's entirely the wrong way to look at it. Uh, you want to simplify the code if possible. You know, if you have some gigantic quadruply nested loop um, with a, you know, seven switches and the tool report is false positive, you know, maybe you want to factor that uh, into a little simpler code. However, if it's simply telling you that the return value of, you know, the function foobar is not being checked, slapping a void cast in front of it is the wrong solution because in the future, if the return value of foobar ever does become important, uh, now you can't find it. You just slap the void cast on it, you shut it up, and now you're never going to get that report. Um, so having a small number of false positives, if you can annotate them in some way or mark them so that you know to ignore them in general, but you always want to be able to find them uh, and you want to keep them coming because if you go too far in trying to gag the tool, you're going to end up gagging the results as well. So, um, if you are in a position of management or you're a consultant to a company, you're going to go in, you might try to deploy an uh, analysis tool. So, how do you get other people to use it? Um, developers uh, are strangely reluctant to use tools which can help them a lot of the time. Uh, it's a lot more work. Uh, it's one out of two is that you know, if now every day before you start coding, you have to come in and check your daily bug report. You know, it's an extra half hour per day. Um, if you have to run the tool before you check in, you know, it delays the check-in process. It makes compile times longer. Uh, there's a lot of complaints. Um, so uh, convincing them of the value of the tool, um, you know, you have to overcome these obstacles. And accountability, um, good or bad. Uh, developers, you know, there's a lot of fear that Perhaps, you know, if Johnny in the next cube down only has 10 defects and you have 50 defects, well, who's going to get promoted and, you know, who's getting the raise and who's not? So, um, I think that one thing is if you are in a position or if you are, you know, encouraging somebody to use this is do not set it up where um, developers are necessarily, you know, their performance review is somehow tied to the output of a static analysis tool. Uh, static analysis tool, as I mentioned, has false positives and false negatives. It's not necessarily a true reflection of a developer's performance. Um, and also, uh, one uh, interesting anecdote I heard was a developer did not want to use the static analysis tool 
um, because if he just looked at a result and decided that it was a false positive or otherwise a harmless issue and marked it as such, and then later uh, that same issue actually caused a problem in the field, in the shift product, because he decided it was harmless, now there is a audit log which shows that not only did the developer know about it, but he looked at it and he claimed to have understood it and failed to do so. And so a lot of developers are pretty scared about that. Um, I think this is, you know, just, it's a cultural problem. Uh, and there's no technical solution to it. Um, but given you need someone on the, in order to get a tool to be adopted, you need an internal champion. You need somebody who's going to stand up, take ownership of the tool, make sure that it's running every night, uh, looking at the results, and encouraging other people to use it. Um, and there's a degree of maintenance involved. Um, this can be build engineer or developer, but you need to verify that all the code going out the door is getting checked. Uh, as you add new code to your build, do you remember to adjust your build to run the analysis tool on the new code? Uh, do you have parsing issues in the new code because you're running the analysis tool at the wrong time and the pre-generated um, header file has been deleted already? Um, a lot of issues like that. So. You want to look at what it's finding, what it's not finding, and making sure that it's finding, and, or at least looking at the parts, piece of the code that you want it to. So, short roundup. Uh, static source code analysis uh, can be useful to augment other forms of analysis. Um, you know, it's really confined to developers for now because you need the source. Um, but unfortunately, adoption is slower lacking in many organizations. Uh, I think this is detrimental to the software industry as a whole. Um, and so as people you know, here might encourage developers to start using uh, you know, disassemblers and fuzz testing uh, with your uh, development efforts, you know, source code analysis is also uh, part of the puzzle. And much like secure programming, um, performing analysis requires dedication and patience. Uh, a lot of people, you know, it's process change. <laughs> people are used to, you know, using get and stir copy. You know, now they know that they can't, uh, even if it, you know, makes the code twice as long as their bounce checks. So this, you know, slows down the development process uh, a little bit short term, but long term uh, should make it faster. <laughs> so that's all. Uh, I'd like to thank Recon for, you know, hosting. Uh, I've been exposed to a lot of, you know, the reverse engineering stuff is not something I work with every day, uh, so it's pretty neat to be here. And of course, Coverity, who's uh, putting the bill for me to show up. And uh, at this time, take any questions. Um, when when I, I looked a little bit at the numbers in 1970, I would also know what the error rate of source code per thousand lines are nowadays, well, you know, the, the, band, the bandwidth. Okay. I mean, NASA software is very well built, but it costs $10,000 per document that's about three, ten lines of code. So, in your experience, what is the error rate? And, and as I joined to that question, the distribution of the, I mean, the public follows a Pareto rule, right? The 10% of the bugs cost 90% of the problems. So, which one should people concentrate on? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, I would say in commercial software that we're seeing, um, if it's developed in a normal environment, um, there is, for our tool, we detect about like one defect in a thousand lines, two thousand lines, um, which, you know, resource leak, buffer overrun, um, various uh, null pointers, stuff like that. Um, that, of course, you know, I would say that we detect, you know, maybe one bug in two. Um, there's a lot of bugs, you know, you click the red button and the blue light went on. You know, bugs like that, you're not going to find. Um, with source code analysis. So if you're counting those as defects as well, um, you know, say we're finding maybe one and two um, defects. Um, the important ones, uh, I would say a lot of defects, developers tend to push them off as harmless. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Um, it really depends on the code base. Uh, for some people, uh, resource leak is completely irrelevant because uh, they're, they're running CGI. It's going to run through, you know, two seconds and then it's done. So if they spot memory out, you know, all over the place, it doesn't matter because attempting to insert freeze is going to lead to the problem that maybe if they're if they're not careful, you know, as the code is developed, they're not careful with where the pointers are going. 
So they can't free the memory without introducing double freeze. So a leak is better than corruption. Um, so your ability to determine what bugs are critical is case by case. But if you have to give a general recommendation, should you go after buffer overflows? Should you look more at base conditions? Because these okay. tools will found a thousand bugs and nobody will fix a thousand bugs. They'll fix ten or five. So you have to give a ranking, right? Yes. You have to. Um, I would say, you know, a buffer overrun um, is likely to cause a problem. Um, a lot of people get by with off by ones, you know, just do like stack alignment. So, you know, is an off by one a critical bug or not? I mean, it's actually very hard to say. Um, you know, if it's on the stack, it actually might not be a problem. Um, other times, you can assess to some extent whether things are critical. Um, if you're doing security analysis, like an SQL injection or something, uh, I would say, you know, you can automatically flag that as critical. Um, in general, if you're looking at a tool and it reports a thousand issues uh, and they're categorized, I would start with the reports uh, in whichever category there are the fewest of. Um, it's one way to approach it. So if it reports uh, four types of defect X and 900 of defect Y, look at the, look at the four in X first and then move on to Y. Thank you.